everything pertaining to God is pure and sacred to you. You don't treat it as, you know, opinions. You don't treat it as a history book. You treat it as the very words of God, which it is. Right? Under the pure, those that have forsaken the world and reconciled themselves unto God holy, right, all things of God are pure. Okay, now, we do know there's blessing and cursing in everything. But if you're pure, right, if you're seeing things through a spiritual eye, you understand that the things aren't necessarily the problem. What is it? It's how we use them. So we can't extend it to things of the world, but we don't desire the things of the world. God promised to equip us with everything that we would ever need. But everything I need after I get saved, even though it may pre be provided in the world, among the world, as we travel through the world, comes directly from the hand of God. Everything that we're ought to be equipped with comes from God. Our new creature comes from within, from the Holy Spirit, put in us by God. But all things are pure to those that are pure. Because those things that we desire, where do they come from? From Him. God give you anything that's pure. If it become defiled, that's our fault, not His. Right? We didn't maintain it. We were entrusted with it, but we did not understand, or maybe we forgot, maybe we forsook, the importance of keeping those things which God gave to us as He gave them to us. In fact, it was one of the... <laughs> breathe your gospel. Anything entrusted to Christ, He keeps it just as it was given to Him. Even that reed that they gave them while they were beating him in the hall of praetorium, that was a dried piece of grass. Right? That would crumple if you blew on it the wrong way. But it says that they took it from him after they beat it. Why? Because anything given to Christ, he keeps it. In the same state that it was, he protects it. He promised that if we would give ourselves to him, that he'd take us and he'd, we're in his hand, his hand's in the Father's hand. He promised that wasn't, nothing was going to happen to us. Right? That we were secure. Set. We have an anchor within the veil. Right? Well, under the pure, all things are pure. But under the defiled. Right? Well, the defiled. We'll define it here in a second. But you got to get through the verse first. It says, under them that are defiled and unbelieving. Why is someone defiled? Because of unbelief. If you believe truly believe right, which means that you are convinced that it's true then why wouldn't you do it right the reason that men stay undefiled or the reason that men are pure is either because they believe or they don't believe some believe in part and don't believe in part they believe enough to get saved but they don't believe enough to live as a new creature right but he says under the defiled the unbelieving, all things. Right? He says nothing's pure. Nothing's sacred. Nothing's worth holding on to. Why? Because the defiled are all about getting as much as they can right now and not thinking about what they have to trade away to get it, what they have to give up to give it. They are concerned with what they can use now. They take no thought for tomorrow. Right? They may have a grand scheme down the road, but they'll nickel and dime, they'll steal, they'll rob, they'll do whatever it takes today to get to where they want to be. They're willing to defile themselves. Why would they not defile the things of God? Then, goes on to say, even their mind and conscience is defiled. Verse number 16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being an abom abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. He's talking about, go back this afternoon, sometime throughout this week, read the chapter start to finish, to get the context. He's talking about people in the church. The Christians that had been saved. Okay, I mean, verse number... Maybe at 12. He says, 
one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Verse 13, this witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. You can't be sound in the faith if you're not of the faith. He's talking about people that have been saved, but God's trying to turn them into that new creature. Don't look down on them. You had rough edges when you got saved too. All you knew is that God loved you, God saved you, and you didn't know what God was fixing to do, but you was just happy to be saved. Right? Well, these people are the same way. They may have had some sharper and rougher edges, but the Apostle Paul saying, the reason people don't change after they get saved, the reason that people stay as they are, is because they profess that they know God. But their whole life says that they deny Him. Something doesn't add up here. Right? The math equation, God plus you equals more like God. Right? That's how the Bible says it'll be. You get saved, God moves in, you're going to start having fruits of the Spirit. You're going to start acting like Christ if Christ is allowed to take root and bloom in your life. But the parable of the sower didn't just have the good, good ground, the good dirt. Right? There were many examples where the seed was planted, the roots started going into the ground, but then the plant never grew. But what are those? I mean, go read Jesus' explanation. They're those that receive the word. They believed it. They got saved. But they never grew. Some had too many rocks in their life. The cares and you know, stony ground. Fruits couldn't get deep enough to get the water and nutrition that it needed. They weren't grounded in the truth. Right then there are those that the cares of the world choked them out. The thorns and the weeds kept them from growing. Right? And then the one that didn't take root were the ones that cast by the wayside that's stolen away by birds and critters and everything else. That one didn't take root, but all the other ones did. It started to grow. But see, verse number 16, he says, they profess it, but in works they deny him being abominable right if you're like me only time you've ever heard the word abominable was referring to the abominable snowman okay no abominable means it has a reputation of being terrible destructive Right? If someone, the reason he was called the abominable snowman, even though I don't believe Yetis exist, but the reason they called him the abominable snowman is because if you ran into him, he's going to mess you up. Right? Had a reputation for killing people. Had a reputation for causing avalanches. That's what they believed caused the avalanches over there back in the day. Right? That he'd get angry, hit the side of the mountain, and then all the snow came down and killed everybody. Right? He was abominable. But because he was abominable, he was cast out from society, is what they originally taught. Abominable means that you claim to be a part of something. You may look right, may talk right, may come to the right places, may go through the right routines, but your whole life is a testament that I want nothing to do with that. And in fact, your life is destructive to the very thing that you want to be a part of. Abominable. Then, he was going to say disobedient. We know what that one means. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. Right then, and unto every good work, reprobate. I see that word reprobate means useless, tested out, worthless, no value to it. Okay term originally comes from smelting and mining and jewelry making where they take ore because little known fact you don't just go find gold pure gold just hunk in the ground and oh hey I found gold no you have to crush up the rock that it's mixed in with 
the gold and the rock are together. You've got to crush it or wait for it to get washed away from the rock in the water and then go panning for it. But you've got to crush it, separate the gold from the rock, from the dirt. And then, once you have the gold, you've got to heat it from all the little itty-bitty pieces and then make it into a gold bar. But see, some gold was tainted. There was impure. There was something about it that you couldn't get the rock out of the gold. The same is true for silver, for iron, for any type of ore. You got to get it away from the rock, right from the dirt, from the things of the world, for it can be used to be turned into something precious. Okay, but the jeweler, or the banker, whoever back in the day they were making things out of precious metals. They would heat it, and they'd scrape off the impurities. They'd heat it again, heat it again. With silver, you'd do it seven times, right? It's the illustration that God gave us for the Word of God on why your KJV 1611, okay, is the perfected work of God's translation of the Bible, for English-speaking people. Okay? Gold, same process, depending on what you was trying to get, whether it was 24 carat or 18 carat or 12 carat, whatever it was. Right, there was a different process for it. But if you'd heat that gold up and the rock wouldn't separate, or you'd heat that silver up and you couldn't get the impurities out of it, no matter how hot it got, no matter how long you tried to do it over and over again, they'd take that silver or that piece of gold that couldn't be separated and they would call it reprobate. It had the potential to be valuable, but you couldn't get the unvaluable out of it to use the valuable. It was worthless. Was it gold? Yeah, it was gold. But it was also more than gold. People don't like a mostly gold ring. Okay, People don't like gold with a little bit of rock still left in it. Right? Hanging from one of their ears. Okay? The whole appeal of it is that it is pure gold. It is valuable. Well, how do you get it valuable? You've got to remove everything that's unvaluable. Reprobate means that the valuable and the unvaluable couldn't be separated. Tested out worthless. Had potential. Could have been used. That was no different than the rest of the gold other than that it just wouldn't let go of where it came from. That's what reprobate meant. Okay, what is, okay, the Bible talks about God will mark sinners, those that are lost. If they get to a point where their conscience has been seared with a hot iron, he'll mark them as reprobate. And at that point, God won't deal with them about being saved anymore. That's not what this verse is talking about. This is talking about, again, saved people. So if we know how God treats the reprobate of the world... We know that God takes it very serious if he were to call one of his own reprobate. Right? I wonder, well, I just read this, verse that came to my mind was that because of sin, because of people taking the Lord's Supper unworthily, the Apostle Paul wrote that for that reason, many of them were sick among them, and that some had been turned over for the destruction of the flesh, that the soul might be saved. God decided that they were worthless down here because they wouldn't let the gold separate from the world. So God said, there's one way to do that, and that's to bury the flesh and take the soul to heaven. Right? It grieved the person's very soul that was saved that person wouldn't make up their mind to just forsake the world and follow after God. They were useless. Can't do anything with somebody that doesn't want to let go of what they used to be. Right? What is it that that gold held, holds on to that makes it reprobate? The dirt, the ground, where it came from. It could have been used to make fine jewelry, vessels of honor. Right? I mean, Solomon wrote that, you know, word fitly spoken, like, pictures of apples, gold frames. Maybe God just wants to turn you into a nice 
you know, picture frame, put his son right in the middle of it. We're supposed to, you know, what do picture frames do? They catch your eye. Why? So that you look at what's in the picture frame. Right? Maybe we're just supposed to shine a little bit. Right? Let your light so shine. Why? So that when they look at us, they get a good, look, good glimpse of the true light. He's the light of the world. Right? I've often said, we have no light of our own. Right? All the light that's given to us, we're just reflecting from heaven. It's our job to just make our mirrors as shiny as possible. Make sure that we're facing Him and then get angled right to where the world, when they look at us, sees Him. Why? We're robed in His righteousness. If they were to look at us and we being robed in His righteousness fully embraced it, let go of everything else in the way, when they'd look at us, they'd see what the Father sees, which is Him, the Son. Again, they were called Christians because they were Christ-like. But see, some are reprobate. Where does that reprobate? You know, determination. But long before you ever become reprobate, as a believer, there's a point, if we go back to verse number 15, where there's a faith problem. There's a belief issue. Okay, under the pure, all things are pure. Why? Because they believe that all things come from God for the purpose of God to accomplish the will of God so that His Son be glorified. Right? That those that don't know Him would come to believe on Him, what happens? The Son gets glorified. Those that get saved, right? Bury the old man. They crucify the flesh, nail it to that cross, take up their cross and follow after Christ. Who gets the glory from that? He does. Right? We deny ourselves to embrace Him. We reject who we used to be to take on who He wants us to become. All that does is glorify Him. But you don't do that if you don't believe what God told us. That if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. That He wants us to become vessels of honor. That we know how to possess our vessels. Keep it sanctified and pure before God. Separated unto God for God's use. And that he didn't want us to be servants. What did he call us? Friends. And because we were friends, he kept nothing from us that the Father had shared with the Son. And considering that they were one, the Son knew everything. He kept nothing from us. Right? Your Bible was written to encourage, to strengthen your faith. So that you continue to believe. And then when you believe, you keep it pure. You treat it as pure. Right, if I had an envelope, one of them security envelopes that even if you held it up to the light, you couldn't see what was inside of it. Right, and I told you that there was a check for $1 million in there with your name on it. If you believed me, you'd take care of the envelope. Even if you never opened it. Right, if you didn't believe me, you'd let the envelope just fall on the floor. Right, if you believe, you'll treat it as valuable even though you've never seen it, even though you can't prove that what I said is true, if I say, but if you open it up before tomorrow, check's going to be void. Or if I tell you that you've got to go put it in the bank today, even though they're closed, you've got to go through the ATM, and you've got to put that thing in there. Because I dated it, you know, some of them checks expire. I don't have them. I don't have enough money to be important enough to get them checks. Okay? But some things are time sensitive. If you believe it's time sensitive, you'll treat it like it's time sensitive. If you believe that what God said is true, you'll treat it as pure. That if you believe that police officers will actually pull you over for speeding, you don't speed. But if you speed, you're going to find out that you was wrong. <laughs> you may get away with it today, but eventually one of them is going to get you. But what's my point? The problem is not that God's not true. The problem is not that the things of God are any less pure or holy or righteous or deserve to be treated with any less respect than they deserve. Now, his ways change not. We know that. So if someone 
goes from treating the things of God as pure. Now, there was a time that some people used to get excited about coming to church. Right? Why is that? Because they treated the house of God as pure. They got excited about singing new songs out of the hymnal because it was a new song that they could learn to sing about their Savior that they love. Now, they didn't grumble and compl- when they had to open the book up and actually learn to you know, read the song as they're singing it. I'm going to sing one of, the old, one of the old favorites. We'll get back to it eventually. Just get on board. But if it's about him, I want to sing it. But, when do those things stop becoming precious and pure in our eyes when we don't believe that they're as valuable as we used to? When our faith has been impacted. So, with the Lord's help, even though we've been teaching on it for the rest of the class, we're just going to teach on from faithful to reprobate. Under the pure, all the things of God are pure. They can see that God gave it for a reason. They may not understand why God did the things the way that He did. His ways are above our finding. Unless God told us in here, you could spend all day, rest of your life thinking about it. You're not going to figure it out. His ways are above our ways. Why did God choose to use a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud to lead the Israelites throughout the wilderness? Well, one, so that they could see them. I could figure that much out. Right? They needed a representation that God was leading them. So he gave it to them. But why did he choose fire and cloud? I don't know. He's God. He can use whatever he wants to. He could have used a tsunami wave to go in front of them if he wanted to in the middle of the desert. Right? Why did he send quail and not pigeons? Probably because there aren't pigeons over in the Middle East. But if God wanted pigeons, the pigeons would have showed up. I don't have a problem with any of that. But see, to make it more practical, when does praying not mean as much to you? When you don't think that your prayer is accomplishing anything. When you don't believe that there's power in prayer. When does the Word of God stop being pure to us? When we think that we already know it all or everything that we need to know, uh, or when we become convinced that this is it is you know more reputable, more truthful, more practical to your daily life than the opinions of others, your own reasoning, lean not on your own understanding. Right? Never get to the point when you think you've arrived, because. The man thinks that he's saying, let him take heed lest he fall. But see, all that has to do with is what? Pride. Truly. Thought about it this week. I'm going to try and get you all caught up on the math. Okay, we've heard our pastor teach up. It's the best summary I've ever heard of it. But the essence of sin is what? My right to my claim to myself. Where did sin come from? Pride. Self. Right? There was deception involved, but he believed that if she ate of the tree, she'd become his God. It was all about her. Why did Adam eat of the fruit, even though he knew the fruit that he was eating? Eve didn't deceive him. She, he knew exactly what it was, but he took it and ate it. Why? Well, Bob doesn't tell us. But I've heard a whole lot of reasoning out there. But the truth is because Adam wanted to. The commandment that God had given him was no longer pure. The instructions that God gave on what he was supposed to be doing no longer mattered. Because it became about Adam in that moment. Right? What kills your faith? Self. And if anything, it's not a faith. What is it? Sin. So we know that without faith, it's impossible to please them. We know that one. We know that if it's not of faith, that it's sin. Right? So what causes to go from faith to sin? Pride. My right to my claim to myself, what's that mean? I want to be able to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it, and I don't want you 
to have any right to tell me whether I'm right or wrong about it. I want to do what I want to do, and I want to be left alone. You realize that everything in that statement flies in the face of what it is to be a child of God. I've been bought with a price. My life is no longer my own. I have no say. My say is whether I want to do it or whether I don't. Whether I'm obedient or disobedient. That's my say in the matter. My opinion, my rebellion, right? And rebellion's a sin of witchcraft. Where's rebellion come from? Pride. Rising up against authority because you think you're right and authority's wrong. Right? Anything that I do isn't going to change anything in God's eyes. The truth is still the truth. Pure things are still pure. He still intends me to do the same thing whether or not I do it. He's in control. I'm not. I'm in control of this. And that's too much for me on some days. So, in order to go from faith, you're pure. Doesn't say sinless. Doesn't say perfect. But everything that God's dealt with you about, you've done your best to say, Lord, you've shown me that this is wrong in my life. I want to give it up. There's nothing between you and God. There's no iniquity. There's no open sin. Are we going to sin? Yes. But when we do, we get it made right. Not the next time we go to the house of God, then and there. Right? You walk right and you talk right, not because you fear God, but because you want to be like the Son of God. You yield your old desires and embrace the new ones that He put in your life because you love the things of God more than what you used to be doesn't say that you're perfect but in the eyes of God you are because we've already said it you're robed in his righteousness he sees his son and our desire to embrace that new calling that new position will keep you pure but man cannot serve two masters he'll love one and hate the other doesn't say you can love one and then tolerate the other no if you love God you hate the world that's what your Bible teaches and if you love the world, you hate God, the things of God, and you don't consider them pure. The thing that kills your faith is yourself. Does he thankfully... Okay, I don't know about you, but see, when I read the Bible and it says that God gave man a measure of faith, that means that there's always a chance for somebody to get things made right until God says that they're reprobate. Reprobate means useless. Because if God gave you something, only God can take it away. You can try and kill your faith all you want to, and a person can live a wicked life that none of us would think that there's ever any hope for them. But if they choose to exercise that faith, it doesn't matter what they did before, you can't take away the faith that God puts into somebody. How much faith did God give everybody? Enough to believe on His Son. Because He's no respecter of persons. If you've got more faith than that, it's because you've embraced it, treated it as pure, and grown it. But even if you weed it all the way back, the world can't take it from you because God put it in you. You can't take it from yourself because God put it in you. There's always still enough faith in somebody to get right, get saved, right, return to the Father's house from being a prodigal. Right? Just thought I had this week. But pride. Kills faith. Because pride looks to me and I become the ultimate authority. The only things that are pure are what I say is pure. I lean on my own understanding and as a result of that, I cripple myself, I blind myself. Okay, that's why those that are defiled are those that are unbelieving. We go down to verse number 15 again says but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure defiled means that you've ruined it defiled means that you introduced something that changed whatever this was to where it can never go back to the way that it was before that's why sin defiled man because after sin man could no longer return to the state that man was in the garden Man had become defiled. 
Right? If left unchecked, man would have died and went to hell. Okay? Regardless of whether you get saved or not, you're still defined. This flesh is going back to the ground. It's cursed to go to the ground. That we, nothing can change that. It's appointed unto men once to die. What's that mean? God said sin causes death long before He ever made man. Like back in the Alpha time, God being holy, anything that wasn't of God, right, brought death because God is life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Right? He can't cause death. What causes death? Sin caused death. Okay. Sin defiled. Right? In the eyes of the defiled. What's that mean? You've introduced something in your life that unless God does something about it, you cannot return to where you used to be. You can't pretend that everything's okay when you're defiled. Right? There is no tide to go stick with sin where, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, scratch it out, pretend like it never happened. Right? Sin is a stain that is too deep for us to handle. But thankfully, 1 John's still in the Bible. If we confess, he's faithful to forgive. I mean, it still baffles me. I was thinking the other day about that Sunday school that I taught on Easter one year, about all the things that he did in three days and three nights while he was in the ground. Okay, when he went and he collected the blood, because it says that he went and he took it and put it on the mercy seat. Right? When he shed his blood, he didn't just shed the blood that it would take to save you. He shed blood knowing that after he saved you, you'd still sin. And he collected that blood to take back to heaven and say, Father, I'll save them and I'll keep them saved. But even if they defile themselves afterward, I've already paid the price for that too. He can undo the defilement. But in truth, unless you think that the things of God and the ways of God are pure, if you find out that you're defiled, it doesn't matter to you anymore because being undefiled isn't a pure thing anymore in your eyes. Defiled means that something's been changed, altered, that can't be undone for a, for a bad thing. But if you improve something, we don't call that defilement. It means you've ruined it. Whereas our pastor says you've earned it. I don't understand why he can't say the word ruined. It's three syllables. He tries to say it as one syllable. Okay. He's more of a Yankee than I am. He was born in Ohio. But under them that are defiled and unbelief, it, you can't separate the two. If you're defiled and believing, that means that you believe that the things of God are pure. You did something to defile yourself, but because you believe, you want to get made right. That's not someone that's defiled. That's somebody that's just in the process of repenting. But we got to admit, even if we try to live our best, we start thinking that we've arrived we're going downhill real quick because then when we mess up we think well it's not that big of a deal but see no those that understand I defile myself all the time but he forgives me all the time like he promised he would what stops that process of keeping you pure unbelief defiled and unbelieving stays defiled because in truth, really, you can't change your salvation. Eternal security. Right? Hallelujah. I can't sin. Okay, just for the record, we're not, this is not free will Baptist teaching. I'm just saying, if I lost my mind, okay, and I am no longer sane, which some of y'all think I'm already there. But if I went off the deep end and went out and committed every sin that I could, Right? No longer in my right mind. It can't undo my salvation. Because he sealed me. Okay? But, because I love my salvation, appreciate it, I don't want to defile it. But truly, I can't taint it. It's something that God did. I can't change it. 
Even if I wanted to be unsaved, he couldn't do it. Right? Because his word says that it's forever settled in heaven. In fact, the only thing that I find that can undo it is if you take away from the word of God, he'll take away your name out of the book of life. That's the only thing that I find can undo salvation. Why? Because to take away from this, you're taking away from your own salvation. Because the Bible says that he did every jot and tittle, fulfilled the law. What's that mean? If I take away from the word or the law of God, I take away from my salvation. That's another math problem we don't have time to get into. Right, but back to the, defilement just means more you, less of God. Right, the opposite of what John said, he must increase, I must decrease. Why? Because now it's about me. I'm the most important thing in my life. Well, if I'm the most important thing in my life, of course I'm going to believe me over the Word of God because I think I'm right. You can convince yourself of anything if you tell yourself something long enough. If you remove those opinions that are contrary to you, if you start ignoring what the pastor's teaching, what the pastor's preaching, because in your eyes, it doesn't matter anymore. If you remove all dissenting opinions, they call that a vacuum chamber. But that's all them people on Twitter that only retweet and talk about each other. What do they do? They've gotten rid of every other opinion that they don't agree with, and they think that everybody believes like they do. Echo chamber. I say something, yeah, I just hear it parroted back to me. Does everybody around here believe like I do? You're the same way. You're made just the same way that they are. But we're fearfully and wonderfully made. In fact, God made it so well that as a man thinketh, so is he. This has a whole lot of power over you. Just like the emotions in your heart have a whole lot of power over you. It says believing and undefiled. Or defiled and unbelieving. I missed it up. Is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Christ told the Pharisees, it's not what goes into the body that defiles, it's what's on the inside that defiles the outside. Right? They got all angry because his disciples didn't wash their hands before they ate food. Under the law, that would have made them tainted in the eyes of God. Because they took the world, added it to the food that God gave them, and then consumed it. They defiled the food that God had given them. That food being defiled would have defiled them. Okay, There are still sects in the world today that believe and teach that. And there's this thing called Sharia law. That's what it all has to do with. They think if you defile yourself, they're going to take you out and kill you because if you're defiled, you defile the whole bunch. Anybody ever heard of little leaven, leaven at the whole lump? That's true, but they believe in a different God that taught different things, but they believe it and it's pure to them. But, well, verse number 16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being an abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. If you are defiled, doesn't matter what, even your attendance, the things that you do try to do for God, they're worthless. Sounding brass, tinkling cymbals, wood, hay, and stubble that are going to burn up before the judgment of God. Uh, even those things that we do of the self, the arm of flesh will fail you. The only way we can accomplish any good work for him is to do it through the power of God. How do we do that, Faith? What do we not want to be? Reprobate. You know what Ichabod stamped above the door means? This place is worthless. So God left the camp. They became reprobate. On their way to heaven. But useless for the ministry of God. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.